I am the Philosophical Bachelor and today I'm going to give you an introduction to Being and Nothingness by John Paul Sartre. Being and Nothingness, published in 1943, is a treatise by John Paul Sartre on human consciousness. Consider his magnum opus, this book explores the modes of our being, which are being in itself, being for itself and being for others. It is a response to the phenomenologists before him, such as his first proponent, Edmund Husserl, but more critically to Husserl's most famous student, Martin Heidegger. Sartre agrees with Heidegger on the importance of tackling what to Heidegger was the foundational question in philosophy, the nature of being. In Heidegger's Being and Time, which was published in 1927, he examines being in general, after which he then has the basis to examine a more specific type of being, the human being, which he called Dasein, which is literally the being there, this being in the world which is us. Sartre develops this idea focusing on the nature of our consciousness. Before human consciousness can arise, there is first the question of being, specifically the being in itself. This concept of being in itself, or in short, the in itself, has a priority to the other modes or dimensions of our being. It precedes the other modes. The in itself is as the name suggests, just what a being is, something in itself. It is what it is. However, we are this in itself, but yet we are not just the in itself. What makes us into something more, something that transcends the solidity and fixity of the in itself of the present moment, is our consciousness, or what he terms the for itself. What is this for itself? Some of you might have mentally translated that term into spirit, soul, mind, the mental, the psyche, the cogito, and indeed Sart is pointing at all these, but not in a speculative or theological way. His approach is phenomenological, which means that he is examining our consciousness from our experience of it. The in itself is what we are when we are thrown into the world. Our existence is a given, it just is what it is. The technical term Sartre uses is facticity. What we are in itself can be described by facts, such as the facts that we are beings that breathe through our lungs, with one heart, two hands, a brain with a central nervous system, and so on. If all we are, if all that there is, is the in itself, then it will be a fixed being, unchanging in its qualities and essential. That is, it will be an object with a fixed essence and unchanging. Its existence is contingent, but once in existence, it is necessarily the way it is. It would be complete in itself if it was the only mode of our being. However, it is not the only dimension of our being. Within the plenitude and completeness of the in itself, there is what Sartre refers to as a worm of nothingness. The image that comes to mind is a juicy apple, but with a worm at its core that eats away at it internally. What does nothingness mean? Imagine an empty space. Then imagine the same space but with one thing in it. To speak of the idea that space has something in it, we need to be able to conceive of a space that has nothing in it. For one thing to be distinguished from another thing, even if the other thing is nothing, that other thing must be what the first thing is not. There is an otherness, a negation. That other thing is over there, I am over here. That other person is not me, I am me. The in itself is separated and distinguished from everything else, but what separates and distinguishes them? Nothingness. The thing in a vacuum is distinguished from the nothingness surrounding it. In that way, nothingness lies coiled in the heart of being like a worm, writes Sartre. From nothingness arises the for itself. The for itself is the mode of being that is conscious of things, of the external world and of itself. It is through the for itself, through our consciousness of things and of ourselves, that we question and are able to question the nature of our being. In this essay, I focus on the concluding section of Sartre's Being and Nothingness, which sums up Sartre's exploration of being and consciousness, skipping through his arduous and perilous journey that led him to his conclusions on the nature of being. I have now read it twice, and I have to admit that I do not understand everything. A major difficulty in thinking about our consciousness is that we have to use our consciousness to consider our consciousness. Because we cannot step outside ourselves to examine ourselves, and because we cannot even ever really penetrate into the consciousness of others, it makes the examination of our imminent consciousness a convoluted endeavour. Even to read about it is hard, which makes it incredible that someone has managed to think about it in such a deep and comprehensive way, and actually managed to put it all down on paper. 
To properly understand how Sartre reached his conclusions, one necessarily will have to follow the development of his ideas, his detailed discussion and arguments in all of Being and Nothingness' 800 glorious pages. Because the topic of Being and Consciousness is difficult, that makes Being and Nothingness a difficult book. Even as he tries to be very clear, illustrating his ideas with interesting and curious examples, 800 pages is to me not quite sufficient for him to explain everything clearly. This is my attempt to explain what I understand of the book and I hope that this introduction would pique your interest to tackle the book yourself. The in itself is the object of consciousness. Our consciousness is the for itself and is for itself. What is the connection between them? They seem radically different from each other since the for itself is that which has to be what it is, which means that it is currently not yet what it is, while the in itself is what it is. However, the two modes are united by the for itself. The for itself is the nihilation of the in itself, a whole in being at the heart of being. This nihilation causes an upheaval to the in itself. According to the book's translator, Hazel Barnes, nihilation is a term Sart coined to express the action of consciousness to make a nothingness arise between it and its object. To nihilate is to encase with a shell of non-being, she explains. Consciousness, or the for itself, is not the in itself, but arises from the in itself, which has a nothingness at its heart. To be able to examine the in itself, to be conscious of the in itself, consciousness has to be something apart from the in itself. Yet it has to come from the in itself, since where else could it possibly come from? We have to keep in mind that Sat is an atheist, and is not about to accept the idea that our consciousness could come from a divine source like God. Hence this consciousness which we possess must somehow transcend the imminence of the in itself to come into existence. Where it comes from is the nothingness that is within the in itself. Nothingness can be understood as a negation. To distinguish between two things, one thing has to not be the other thing. So the not, this nothingness, is what makes possible for consciousness to arise from the in itself. To become conscious of the in itself, to reflect on the in itself, thereby making it a self-consciousness. It arises from the nothingness, a privation, a lack in a particular being, and is not something that is autonomous or completely separated from the in itself. It is an internal negation. It uses the in itself to make known to itself what it is not, and consequently what it has to be. Consciousness does not stand alone. It always refers to something. It is a revealing intuition of something. It is a borrowed being which exists only when we examine ourselves and other beings. To do that, it has to be something other than being in itself. In addition, the for itself belongs to a particular individual in itself and not to being in general. To be other than being is to be self-consciousness in the unity of the temporalizing ecstasis, writes Sartre. Ecstasis is Greek, meaning to stand outside of oneself. The for itself apprehends being as something that is changing over time as compared to a monolithic unchanging being which is what the in itself is at any moment. The for itself is not a given. It is not something that is just in the world originally as some other thing because such a thing would then be an in itself. Instead, the for itself makes itself and makes itself an other to the in itself. However, it does not found itself. That is, it does not create itself since it comes from the nothingness in the in itself, but it continuously creates its nothingness. Its reality is purely interrogative, writes Sad. It is always asking about things and about itself. Its own being is in question by the for itself. Its being never becomes a fixed thing, because it is separated from the in itself by the nothingness within the in itself which gives rise to an otherness. Sad figures that if it could ever join with its being, then the otherness would by the same stroke disappear and along with it possible knowledge of the world. Sartre figures that if it could ever join with its being, then the nothingness would by the same stroke disappear and along with it possibles, knowledge, the world. The in itself is primary, that is, it is before the for itself. Sartre's solution to the problem of ontology, that is, the problem of being, is that the in itself is a given which has within itself a nothingness which causes an upsurge of the for itself. To ask why is that the case already presupposes that there is a being that is asking the question. 
But yet, the four itself is the being by which the why comes into being. The four itself questions its own origin, since it is in its nature to be interrogative. Sud thinks that ontology cannot answer this question of how does the for itself arise, because this arising is not in the structure of the in itself, but is instead an event. However, ontology tells us that the nothingness that is within the in itself is not a simple emptiness devoid of meaning, the way we think of nothing as a total void. Instead, the meaning of this nothingness is to be the foundation for the for itself. To found the for itself is a rupture in the identity of the in itself, where consciousness appears as something present to the in itself. It seems as if the for itself is caused by itself. It is self-caused, or in Latin, causa sui. But the for itself is insufficient to be its own being. It is instead like a side effect. The for itself is a side effect which comes from the nothingness within the in itself. This nothingness is a lack, and the for itself arises as a lack. Hence it cannot be self-caused, since something cannot come from nothing. Nonetheless, the for itself aims to cause itself. It aims to be absolute being. It aims to be the in itself, to be its own foundation, but it fails at this project continuously. It does this by doing and having things, by projecting itself into its possibilities of its future, and deciding which possibility would be its project. In its attempt to become in itself, to become complete and to be a finished project. This goal, however, is out of reach, since life is never complete while we are alive, and when it ends, it is simply over. As for the in itself, for the in itself to be its own foundation, to cause itself, it needs to make for itself a consciousness. It is only because we have consciousness that such a question of a possibility of causa sui even arises. The in itself cannot ask such a question since it is not conscious. To found itself, the in itself would already have to be consciousness. Sart posits that ontology would therefore limit itself to declaring that everything takes place as if the in itself, in a project to found itself, gave itself the modification of the for itself. Metaphysics then has to hypothesize what that process was. The hypothesis can only be validated by how well it explains the unity of the givens in ontology, how well it explains what is there. We cannot even look to history since time as a concept, temporality, only comes into existence with the for itself. So what is the reality of our being? Sart points out that the Greeks distinguished two totalities. The first is cosmic reality as a totality, and the second is the first totality plus the infinite void surrounding it. What is then the true totality? Correspondingly, is the in itself being or is the in itself that is surrounded by the shell of nothingness of the for itself being? Even if we consider a total being as the synthetic organization of the in itself and the for itself, there still remains a divide between the two modes since the in itself is what it is while the for itself is what it is not yet. That is, it is not the in itself the way cosmic reality and the void are separate and different. The infinite void in the great universe is nothing. It is non-being, non-existence. It is what is outside the universe. But if the universe is already totalizing, is already everything, what is the thing that stands outside it and what is the status of that thing? This void is non-existent and yet it is conceptually there as a contrast to what is existent. At least in abstraction, there is something there even if that something is nothing. That is the nothingness that is the same nothingness that stands in contrast to being. To have being and to understand being, we realize that there then is also non-being or nothingness. Even more counterintuitively, this nothing within the in itself seems to be productive since from it comes an upsurge of the for itself. This is the question that philosophers have been asking themselves for a long time. How did consciousness arise from material being? And then the wider question. How can something arise from nothing? Since this is the domain of the immaterial, we can only examine this question conceptually, which is what Sartre is doing here. Continuing his analysis, Sartre figures that for a truly unified totality, each part, when separated from the other parts, can only be an abstraction. Its parts cannot stand alone. We are here not talking of just a collection of things that work together. For example, we can remove my lungs, and the lungs can stand alone. My organs work together and it does form a whole, but my lungs are not me and I am not my lungs. 
The lungs are a separable part of my body, which is a collection of organs. This is not the unified totality that Sad is referring to. A unified totality is where there is a whole and the parts cannot subsist outside of this whole, even if we can abstract parts from the whole and study them separately. Outside of the whole, they have no real existence, no real meaning. Consider my example of a cup. If we define a cup to be an object that can contain within itself a liquid, what is the thing that makes a cup a cup if not for the hollowed out space in its centre? Imagine a cup without such a space, a solid cup that does not have an air pocket in its middle. Such a cup may resemble one but cannot serve its function to hold a liquid within itself. Conversely, imagine the hollowed out space without the surrounding walls of the cup. The space of the cup does not subsist if not for the surrounding walls. The cup is a metaphor for this total being that we are trying to apprehend. The space needs the walls of the cup without which the total object is not a cup. The cup needs the space because otherwise it will likewise not be a cup. Without the walls of the cup, the space of the cup cannot subsist, it merges with the space around it. The walls of the cup remain the walls even if there was no space whatsoever, though in that case, it really is not a cup but just a lump of solid material. The in itself is to the walls of the cup what the for itself is to the hollowed out space in the cup. The two things are separate but without both, the cup is not a cup. Without the in itself and the for itself, we do not have a human being. The in itself without a for itself is simply there like a dead body but it is nonetheless still there in the world. The for itself cannot subsist without the in itself. I don't want to say the body since Sartre did not specify that the in itself is a body. In fact, the in itself can be any object, but let's just think of it as a body to make things clear. The for itself, consciousness, needs to be a consciousness of something such as the in itself. Without the in itself, it is like the space of the cup. It cannot subsist. Consciousness when apart from the in itself is merely an abstraction since it then is consciousness of nothing. Sartre has repeatedly emphasized in his book that consciousness is always a consciousness of something, an idea that he inherits from Husserl. When we see the color red, what we have is a consciousness of red. Sartre will write it as consciousness of red with of in brackets since he wants us to get away from the idea that consciousness and the object of consciousness are separate things as a subject looking upon an object. So it will read as consciousness red. There indeed is a subject and an object, but that is not how our consciousness works. Instead, what we have is a red consciousness. Our consciousness of redness is within our consciousness. It is not merely something out there in the world, but it's in our consciousness. The redness that we experience is in our consciousness. In fact, redness is not out there in the world since animals or a colorblind person may experience the color of a red object as something other than redness. This redness is hence not objectively out there, but is what our consciousness experience. This is why Sartre's analysis is phenomenological. It's an analysis of our experience and suspends the natural attitude where we assume what is experienced is also what is objectively out there in the world. This suspension of the natural attitude is what is technically called the phenomenological reduction by Husserl. The for itself is a consciousness of the in itself. The for itself cannot exist without the in itself because the for itself is annihilation of the in itself. That is, it is built on the nothingness that is within the in itself and is unified with the in itself. The in itself, however, has no need of the for itself. It simply exists, though without the for itself, it would not be aware of its existence. It would not be conscious of itself. The phenomenon of the in itself requires the for itself to be conscious of itself. However, in its being, in its existence, it simply is just there even if there is nothing that is conscious or aware of it. For a unified self, that is, a synthetic organization of the in itself with the for itself, these modes need to be inseparable. However, a self cause of such a being is impossible because of inherent contradictions, where we need the for itself to be conscious of the in itself for such a question of self cause to even arise making it such that already the in itself must from the start have consciousness or the for itself. Such an integration cannot take place however because the for itself is not what it is. That is, it is not the in itself, what the in itself just simply is. There is a detotalized totality. The for itself which reflects on the in itself has to be separate from the in itself, 
has to not be the in itself, that is, it is an other to the in itself. Sartre explains, The question of the synthetic unity of consciousness has no meaning, for it presupposed that it was possible for us to assume a point of view on the totality. Actually, we exist on the foundation of this totality, and as engaged in it. We cannot understand the totality of such a being since we are not able to stand outside our being, which is ourselves, to examine it. Hence ontology arrives at its limit in its investigation of the nature of being. For metaphysics, whether there is a dualism between the in itself and the for itself, or whether they are unified in one being but as a disintegrated totality, is a matter of which is more profitable for knowledge. Sartre takes a pragmatic approach here. The in itself is imminent, what the for itself transcends the in itself to become what it is not. Whichever path the metaphysician chooses, he can then, from that basis, work on other important problems such as that of action. Action involves the in itself as its imminent origin. Action also determines a modification in the for itself, which in turn modifies the in itself. That is, our actions determined by our consciousness modifies us in our very beings. So it calls time as understood by our consciousness temporality. I earlier presented the in itself as something fixed and unchanging. But it can change over time, since our actions modify the in itself which is then fixed up to the present time. Temporality is only something that comes into the world through our consciousness. What is past is fixed in the in itself, since what is past is past, the past can no longer be changed. However, for the for itself, its past does not necessarily determine its future. The for itself is not what it is, not the in itself, precisely because it has the freedom to shape its future through the choice of its possibilities, regardless of how the past has been. Beyond ourselves, acts have an impact in the world, and this effect reveals to us our relations with other beings, which brings our philosophical thinking on the nature of our being into the domain of ethics. We are not alone in the world. There is an external world with external beings in it. Sartre terms these other beings the other. The other gazes upon us, viewing us as in itself, as objects. We also view the others as objects in their facticity. In that mode of being, we are for others, where our identities are modified because of our existence with other people. This mode can lead to bad faith, to shame, but it need not necessarily be only negative. We can also recognize the subjectivity of others. They, like ourselves, are free, and we can wish to further the freedom of the other also. Freedom is the foundation of our values, according to Sartre. Ontology is concerned with the nature of being, and while it cannot by itself formulate an ethics, it reveals to us the origin and nature of value when we are confronted with a human reality and situation. Value indicates a lack. If I value goodness, for instance, it means that there is a lack of goodness in the world. Otherwise, if everything was good, and forever so, goodness would just be a regular state of affairs. The for itself determines its being as a lack, writes Sartre. He proposes an existential psychoanalysis which examines the task of the for itself. The for itself aims at joining with the in itself completely, driven by a lack, a nothingness which it wants to fill and become complete by becoming the in itself. In contrast to Freudian psychoanalysis, which is concerned with the general interpretation of symbols to explain particular thoughts of the individual, existential psychology denies such a general interpretation given the particularities of our individual natures. Existential psychology, unlike Freudian psychology, does not presuppose that there exists such an essence of people that allows a general interpretation. Instead, existential psychology may inform us of the ethical meanings of our projects. Human existence is a passion towards becoming the causa sui. If there is any causa sui at all, anything that can cause itself, it can only be God. And Sartre says that man is a useless passion because this project of becoming causa sui and hence becoming God is unattainable. Sartre critiques the spirit of seriousness which has infected our approach to life. Such an attitude considers values as transcendent givens independent of human subjectivity and transfers the quality of desirable from the ontological structures of things to their simple material constitution. The spirit of seriousness thinks of human value as something objectively given in the world, which as given does not need to consider our individual subjectivity. It reduces our values to being driven by material considerations only. For example, we eat bread because we need food to preserve our existence, but it fails to explain why bread and not rice instead. 
Sad thinks such an attitude is one of bad faith since it obscures why we pursue our goals and it denies our freedom, reducing us to passive objects subservient to physical bodily demands. Existential psychoanalysis instead considers our real goal to be the fusion of the in itself with the for itself, which explains why we have our passions. It reveals to the moral agent that he is the being by whom values exist. Values come from us, which follows then that they are not objectively out there in the world. Because we have the freedom to choose our values, it gives rise to anguish. Sart ends his work with questions that an ethics which is to be developed from our existential freedom must answer. He has intended to develop such an ethics but ultimately did not manage to complete it. The gauntlet was taken up by Simone de Beauvoir, also an existentialist philosopher and Sartre's lover, in The Ethics of Ambiguity. I've yet to read her book but I am indeed intrigued by the kind of ethics that existentialism can bring us given that the existentialist project touches a chord in me. I hope I will be able to present that to you soon. Thank you. If you wish to support The Philosophical Bachelor, you can do so at worldwideweb.patreon.com slash philosophicalbachelor.